DigitalJamSessions.com Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam session. Today we are joined once again by Sarah Jones from Coventry University. Welcome back, Sarah. Hello. Hello. And we also have with us Dean from Brandwith. Welcome, Dean. Hello. Hello, hello. So just for the benefit of our listeners who have not heard you previously on our session, Sarah, would you care to explain very briefly what it is that you do over at Coventry University? Because it sounds very academic. Yeah, I, I always love the answering this question because it's uh, <laughs> a little weird. But for most of my time, I spend my time immersed in a virtual world, mostly doing research around presence and locating presence within VR, within 360 film, how we can better make probably better experiences, I guess, asking and doing all the research that nobody's willing to do. Wonderful. Thank you. And <laughs> Dean, why don't you explain to us exactly what you do over at Brandwith? Oh, exactly. How long have we got? Um, <laughs> Not that long. So, so Brandwit is one of these ever-evolving agencies. We are, which we we can finally fall into the category of being an innovation agency. Now, it, mm. that, I mean, that, again, that sounds like a little bit like we've just given ourselves a title, but it's this, it's what we've done all the all the time we've been in existence, which is for a couple of decades now. And to the outside world, the agency idea is it tends to be that. They, they do a bit of all sorts and and deliver big scale projects. We kind of do, but we're, we're not jacks of all trade, master of none. VR is one of the things that we've done for a long time. Our first piece of VR was 18 years ago. Big old gap in between where we weren't doing any, to be quite honest, because there was, <laughs> there was no relevance at all. But it does mean that we've not, as a lot of agencies have that are multidisciplined have kind of jumped on bandwagons we haven't at all we've always been there right from the outset and mm -hmm. that so my role within that is it's actually to identify new platforms new technologies new ways to creatively use technology but also new ways to be creative and make great stuff on them but vr has been the thing that everyone wants to talk about for the last four years so it just sounds like that's all i talk about <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a really valid point and actually that's one of the things that i love about the fact that i've got both of you on the same uh, session at the same time is the fact that you're not newcomers to this industry. And it's one of my personal bugbears is when I go to events and everybody's all like, oh yeah, it's this new thing. It's just been around for the last few years. And you're just like face palming and it kind of like, you know, you're thinking, no, it's been around for decades. What are you talking about? But what I want to talk about very specifically is the fact that you two crazy souls have been in VR for 48 hours doing a crazy event that you called VR48, which I, I have to say hats off to you. You're braver than I, because I personally do not want to wake up in VR. It's just a thing I do not want to do. But you did this. And I want to talk about, first of all, let's explain to our lovely listeners, what was VR48? And then we can talk about some of the madcap crazy things that you did during VR48. So Sarah, I know that before you was telling us all about your spells, now tell us all about your VR48. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so so Dean and I have known each other within VR for, for a couple of years, and I always like to think that he's the male equivalent of me, which is crazy <laughs> for everybody who knows me to know that there's somebody else equally as insane. But we, we were chatting and, and talking about reality and consciousness and an event, and it's those questions I get really excited by, you know, how we can create a world that is so real that, that we are fully present and it's mm. that distinction between reality and consciousness and we basically said you know if we wake up in VR and we think that it's real we've got there so I said we just need to wake up in VR all the time and Dean said well I've already done that I did 24 hours <laughs> last year and I said yeah but that's not good enough let's do 48 hours and then it was about two hours later in a conference where Dean announced to everybody there that we were going to do 48 <laughs> hours in VR. Committed. Uh, so I kind of had to go along with it and along with everything else that he said. Mm. So, so that, that's what the idea was. And it was about exploring those, those real applications of VR. I'm not a big gamer. I don't sit and play games every night. But I love the technology and how it can really transform everyday life and mm -hmm. everyday applications of it. And that's what we wanted to try and really interrogate. How does VR impact normal life and how does it impact our health as well? So that's what VR 48 was all about. So here's the thing, and I find this really interesting, is that you've mentioned very specifically that you're not really what you would term as a hardcore gamer. Dean, would you consider yourself kind of a hardcore gamer or not? I mean, I was when I was younger, when I had time, I didn't have family and all sorts of other responsibilities. And now that sounds like I, I spend a lot of time with my family. They would 
beg to <laughs> differ. <laughs> now, just it just means that the the kind of the social downtime yes. is is a lot more pressure. So gaming it went off my radar a long time ago. But yes. when I started, you know, when I think it was it was it was the it was, it was one version of of Rift that turned up that it, it finally allowed gave us movement within vr and i was i was testing something in a gaming scenario where i just suddenly i went why would a gamer not for, for the right content what content why would a gamer not want to be in the game mm. you know there is a level of detachment there that you know that people will still sit there and do however long they spend in front of a tv and and be quite happy about it but when you've got a chance to be in a just a first person shooter that you're in in the game you you'll be completely lost in there so i kind of you know i i really had that eureka moment anyway and and with it wasn't as if it was a vr eureka moment but it was certainly a gaming one and mm. that, that that doesn't mean i've got any more time to do it <laughs> now but but vr 48 kind of gave us that opportunity and the, the thing was what we wanted to do with our, our living in vr for two days was to genuinely live so there's been quite annoyingly another couple of records that were, and, and these were genuine guinness world records that were set about two weeks and a week before ours. Now we had the chance to actually go for the GWR record mm-hmm. and we, we had to turn it down because they said, you know, it would be fine if you are not sleeping at all for the, all the time that you're in VR. Now, <laughs> to, to remain awake for two days with no headset on would be a, just kind of a ridiculous feat of endurance. So because we wanted to live in VR, we wanted to do as many things that you do in real life mm. and see what it was like in VR. So not sleeping isn't something that people tend to and unless they have horrendous insomnia is not something they tend to do in real life so the you know we in in doing so every second that we were awake we were filling it with so much variety of content now some of that was gaming but even when we were gaming it was to it was to try and experience things like you know if you're boxing Mm. you know a game delivers that but it was one of the surprises of uh, of the two days that we it was so physically demanding and, and that kind of thing was amazing you know we really so, enjoyed getting those results but here's the thing is is uh, i think that that what you're talking about is actually more interesting than somebody who says i'm going to sit in a game for 48 hours <laughs> that's that's kind of good it's it's fine you know you sit in your gaming chair or whatever and you you play that game and that's great but one of the things that really, I think, appealed to me about what you was doing with VR Forty Eight is the fact that you you were still living your lives, and it was it was that kind of almost like the life study of what a normal person would do. Somebody who isn't, you know, already a gamer, somebody who isn't really, uh, uh, you know, into all of this technology permanently around them and and doing all of these things all of the time. It it feels like it was a more real test of the technology in some respects. But I also want to kind of stress that the content wasn't all gaming. You've said that already, but there were some really interesting applications of what you were doing with the technology. Now, Dean, I know that you got a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And part of the, the reason for this was that you was testing to see, you know, that there's been a lot of talk about things like Snow World and the fact that VR has been proven to reduce the core body temperature of burn victims when they're actually being treated, uh, their burns are being treated. And it also helps as a replacement for things like morphine because it distracts from the pain. And and obviously you got to test this in a very physical way, very permanent yeah. way, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> what was the thinking, what was the sentiment behind that in terms of, I think this was a really interesting case study in terms of actually proving the fact that that, that it isn't all just this talk about burn victims, but actually other applications of medical or or kind of psychological application of VR. You know, I'm I'm going to kind of say distract the mind, but but to to be used in different ways. What's your your take on this, Dean? Well, yeah, I I mean, you've outlined a lot there. And it's what we wanted to do was to see if VR could distract and take you to a level of immersion where it would remove at least a degree of pain and so so, yeah foolishly I had a tattoo but that that was really because it was a short list of of experiences (laughs) again it's not the normal thing to draw up a list of this but but what could you what kind of pain could you endure that would be fairly constant over a sustained period of time so it couldn't be getting my legs waxed or it couldn't be being (laughs) being pierced because that's kind of short sharp pain and and you know no matter how much you try and distract someone from that you know the the sudden punch in the gut would it would 
draw you back out of VR again. So no matter how distracting it was, it wouldn't have given a decent result. So because the tattooing experience was pretty much the same level of pain over a half an hour or 40 minutes, whatever it was. And it was, I was able to through some, again, this was gaming through some fairly intense kind of arcade gaming, able to take myself away from what was going on in the physical environment. So I could have gone, oh, well, well, let's try and relax and go into something meditative. But actually, that's that's not distracting enough. That just calmed you down. But you can still, you, you know, there's still that niggling, well, where's that pain coming from? I'm sat mm. on a beach and it's amazing, but I can feel pain. So, um, you that's know, an interesting, I... that's an interesting observation. Yeah, I mean, and also I mean, the fact that it worked. So if, if you looked at the, if you looked at a, a one to ten level of pain for the tattoo, so if ten was no headset on, looking at what was going on, and that was my kind of maximum pain, I guess it went down to a quarter of a six or a seven. So mm-hmm. you know that's a result. But also we were wearing Apple watches throughout, so we were testing heart rates, mm-hmm. and my heart rate actually dropped. And, and noticeably, I mean, not not down to normal levels, because, again, the results we were doing, I was in a fairly intense arcade gaming environment, so it wouldn't be mm-hmm. totally reduced. But at least there was it wasn't just anecdotal. There was some science behind it as well. OK, so whilst Dean had the tattoo, Sarah, we have to talk about the wing walking, because I I didn't understand the full scope of why he was getting on the, the wing of a plane with a VR headset. You have to explain this to our lovely listeners. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was still asking Dean that question in the morning. <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure of the reason why we're doing this. So can you explain it again? It just seemed like the right thing to do. I'm not quite sure why. But basically, it, I, I'm going to give Dean's line now because I think it's quite good. It was to look at how the real world is experienced through virtual reality, if mm. that makes any sense. I think mm. that's right. So the, the wing walking, we... We, we had a bit of a fail when we were we were doing it. So as anyone that uses Gear VRs on a regular basis will know, pretty much every single time you plug in your phone, it says remove gear device and upload the software. And this happens again and again and again and again. They have more software updates than any other Oh, I, I, I have I have so been it's caught in that set. trap during conferences <laughs> yeah. where we've got like 30 headsets and they all need updates and you just want to bash your head exactly. off the wall. Exactly, yes. exactly. So <laughs> our, our plan was to experience wing walking at the end of our 48 hours, mm. but doing it through the look through camera. So we could have a look at what the real world look like through VR when you're in that environment. And, mm. and the re- reality is it's this strange kind of hyper reality where everything is massively oversaturated and it's a very very strange perception but Dean got onto the top of the plane from the headset <laughs> and he said remove gear device <laughs> which was possibly one of the funniest moments when you look back on it now but for Dean standing on the top of the plane it was so good um, so Dean had the experience pretty much blind and then I had the experience with the look through camera so we could get it working on my device. Mm. And, and it was just really, really weird. And for me, it was interesting because it kind of gave, gave credit to everything that I say about multisensory VR, mm-hmm. that the, the feeling of being immersed in this world, in this kind of letterbox view looking was so heightened by all of these senses and you can imagine when you're going at 135 miles per hour on the middle of a plane you do get that sense of the wind and that the smells and everything is so so enhanced and that's what we need as kind of content creators to create all of these experiences we need to know what it really feels like Mm. but but for Dean he came away with this great sense of of empathy um, because he had the feeling of of pretty much being blind going on this experience Mm. so we had these very very two contrasting experiences and again as Dean said with our data from the Apple watches and everything like that you can see the difference in our heart rate mine's pretty normal even though I'm on the middle of a plane (laughs) but my heart rate is pretty okay but Dean's is a lot higher Mm -hmm. doing it in a, a different kind of environment so so yeah the the wing walking I'm still trying to work out why why we were doing it but i think we are definitely the first people in the world (laughs) in virtual reality take that guinness world records exactly we're taking that one and i'm still still the only female to do a a vr marathon so i will also hold that one (laughs) but 
it was this incredible experience that we need to know. We're, we're always creating experiences for for clients and films and everything else without always experiencing exactly what that feeling is and that's really important Hmm. okay so of all the things that you did do I do recall a rather amusing moment in your little Facebook updates where you were sharing some video footage of you both doing various different things of some some lunchtime snacking that that kind of went slightly awry when there was a headset in your way and you couldn't quite see where you were putting the food would you care to tell us about the, the 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 most I suppose interesting moments that you hadn't expected during your 48 hours what was it that that kind of like, you was just thinking I didn't think it was going to be this difficult or oh okay I, that that's an issue I, I you know didn't think that was going to be an issue what was the things that really kind of stood out for you I'll start with you Sarah I, I think for, for me looking back at, at photos and images and content and things now one of the best images is at the end of day one where Dean's there with a, a plate of fish and chips and I'm there with a a, a vegan pizza it is um, vegan cheese on my pizza and we're both sat there in a headset eating mm. and and it, it's just you know I, I don't know where I was I think I was in Zambia maybe as I was eating my pizza which is a bit odd and, and Dean was probably on um, in space somewhere so so just that that being able to kind of navigate everyday activities but for me what was really interesting one thing that we didn't expect was Facebook spaces had just been launched in beta kind of a few days before and I would never have been able to clear a few days to really try and play and experiment and get used to it all but I had that time so at one point I put the, I jumped into the the Facebook world. I used my world from a film that I'd made in Texas recently. And Dean, as his Facebook avatar, came into my world. And then we used Facebook Messenger to message Andy Meyer, who works in a lot of VR stuff in, in Salford. So we were on on the call to him, we could see him and he could see our world and our avatars. And we were having this conversation. He was on the train in the <laughs> north. So we had all of these different worlds colliding, which was really interesting. And I, I've always sworn that I hate social VR. Um, it just makes me feel awkward and I don't like it. But this mm. was the one time that I thought, actually, although it's really glitchy and loads of things are going wrong with it, it has the potential that I can now see the potential. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, which I, I'm going to ask this question before we go, go to your response on this, Dean. I'm just going to throw this question out to you. Is bearing in mind you spent 48 hours in VR, but you were obviously doing it together as such. And there was a whole group of support around you. But did you feel very isolated during that process? So before you answer the, the, the question about what the standout thing was, Dean, tell me, did you feel isolated? No, I mean, because... You know, a lot of the experiences are normally enhanced with headphones on. And of course, you're fully immersed in everything mm. else. But because Sarah and I were both experiencing similar things at the same time, we we were talking to each other as we were in VR. And it didn't break the illusion at all because mm. visually we were still there and, and there was some kind of audio surrounding us, whatever else. But the fact that we were talking to each other, it never, to me personally, and I think probably Sarah would echo this, we it, we, it just felt like we were both in VR, mm. which is interesting as well, because we're, you know, socially, we're quite obsessed with the fact that it's a really visual experience and everyone's trying to create, to be fair, pretty crappy avatars at the moment. <laughs> and there's a whole business around everyone paying to have re- actually decent avatars for the future. It's going to be like the, the old ringtone business. But um, anyway, that's that's a, that's a topic for another day. But it, it really, yeah, again, echoing Sarah's, fun in in social bases it, the, the fact that we were just it felt like we were sharing that experience was was really good now I think if we'd been uh, as individuals <laughs> there was one guy that said he was one that did set the record that was in New York in an off I think it was an office he's, I think he's just his apartment looked like an office he was isolated on his own for 24 hours just gaming at one point he just threw up in a bucket it was just the whole thing was and i and i think you know my 24 hours before that didn't it it was a lot more i was a lot more isolated but because i was being physical with it again i was walking around london going on the tube all sorts of ridiculous things that probably should have got me killed but it (laughs) but because again these other attempts are just sat in one room and not really doing anything i think that mm. isolation is enhanced so much so so no it didn't it didn't really feel as if we were kind of cut off from the outside world too much 
I just have images of you two running around the, the London tube. <laughs> Give me a headset we, on your we, head. we do have some great images of us trying to cross roads. <laughs> we, we did do a full health and safety. <laughs> or well, I did at least. Yeah, I, I didn't. <laughs> But, but yeah, there were some some great moments crossing roads and just navigating. But but I do think it, it was great, as Dean said, doing it with somebody else. And we yeah. had that, oh, my goodness, what's happening now kind of <laughs> moment a few times, which was really good. OK, so, Dean, what was the standout thing for you that, that you just hadn't expected or you just thought, oh, my God, I didn't realise this was going to be an issue? Kind of two things. Um, I'll try and be brief with them. But what the first one was because... Previously, I'd, I'd, I'd gone through the experience of the falling asleep and waking up in VR bit, which was mm. the previous 24 hours wasn't really an endurance thing. It, it was to experience that on its own. Everything else was a bonus. But doing it the second time, and I think some of it might be to do with content. So the first time I did it, I it was fairly frantic content. And I, and I was just so knackered, I fell asleep and mm. woke up. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a scheduled sleep time as it was this time. And because this time round, we, we were trying to live and do things normally we went to sleep at i don't know it probably was about midnight because we were doing spaces before that but but we used meditative content so we thought there was a better chance of actually falling asleep and in doing so we you know we fell asleep but when you woke up because it was a very gradual process rather than oh crap there's dinosaurs it was it was quite gradual so yeah i think your brain just thought oh right yeah i'm waking up in vr and so for me it didn't feel anywhere near as as kind of magical i guess maybe it was the content and it wasn't it it was a different it was nice that it was a different experience and i i thought i would go through the same thing again but but waking up in a very calm and relaxed environment you just kind of slowly open your eyes and go oh i'm still in here (laughs) um that that, that's probably that's not the anecdote that i I, when i try and enthuse everyone at a conference and go that's amazing especially when you wake up in it that's not usually the one that i'll be quoting at the moment but it's it, it was nice that that was different and then the other takeaway for me was and I mentioned the boxing was that we, this was knockout league I think it was called and we were basically you're facing a cartoon style character mm-hmm. and you know that shouldn't be believable you know you should just be thinking this is a great game in VR but the moment the bell rings you are there and you're fighting you're pretty much you feel like you're fighting for your life certainly fighting for your boxing career that you don't have and <laughs> you know he's the, the fact that you're being punched in the face you're believing that not again because it, oh this is quite realistic it's like there's a real boxing club coming towards me because as you're being hit your vision is blurring so the image that you're seeing is blurring and mm. the content is being desaturated you again don't think oh this is this is nicely rendered you think oh crap i'm being hit in the head and it, the kind of the adrenaline really kicks in so our three minute rounds we were exhausted after that <laughs> and then you know, we wanted the aim was that we were going to do as much physical stuff as possible, and we thought, yeah, the wing walk could be the most, you know, mm. that be the most exertion. No, no, three minutes in VR boxing was, you know, it was a great way to say, look, actually, you can, you don't need to sit on the sofa and vegetate while you're doing this. You can actually build this into your fitness rating routine, and we, and that's a that was going. Mean, we'll come on to this, but it, that was very much about changing the perception of VR, and I think. A lot of the headlines at the moment are very much kind of playing to the sit in, sit in a chair and, and don't move around too much. And I do think a lot of that is actually to do with the, the perception that VR is this gaming thing. And I think Oculus has a lot to, to kind of, you know, take credit for that particular perception, which is it's a, it's a games industry thing. When in actual fact, it, you know, I think that there's a lot to be said for, you know, theme parking out of home, experiential activations of VR but also, you know, the uses in other industries, other verticals. And so I, I do think that perhaps that there is a little bit of that whole, yeah, if you're doing VR, you're a gamer and you're sat in your gaming chair and you're just going to play a game. But I am curious, at any point, did either of you feel like just ripping a headset off? Was there, was there the temptation at some point to just say, I want to be back in reality? Did that happen to you at some point? No, it's pretty fun living in VR, isn't it? Who would want to take off a headset? No, I I think for me, the only time and, you know, we we get lots of questions around feeling sick and all that kind of thing within VR. The only time for me was when I did feel sick. And that was when we were traveling. We went go-karting in VR um, on our first day. But we went 
we, we were being driven to the go-karting place mm-hmm. so we, we had our headsets on and oh, I, I remember watching, this mm-hmm. I was watching some content by um, Story Up Studios um, mm. one of my friends Sarah Hill and I was watching all of this but of course I was watching in a headset and then the car's turning one day one way but I'm looking in the other direction and <laughs> fixed on adjusting and it was that feeling of oh goodness me I don't know where I am now mm. and it was simply being in a car whilst watching something else where I'm not in a car and yeah. that made me feel really sick we both got out of that car and we were both green it, it wasn't it wasn't a good look for us then it's interesting you say this because I know that a couple of people have been saying how they've been trying using uh, a gear VR when they're on a plane and I am curious as to whether or not there's enough motion on a plane that you sense that you're moving whilst you're watching a static movie whether or not that does cause any kind of sickness or not and nobody's answered that question yet so if anybody knows please do let us know because I'm curious to know whether or not I can use this as my alternative entertainment system the next time I fly. But (laughs) having said all of that, what I am curious to understand from each of you is really, given what you've experienced, given given the, the length of time you've now spent in VR consistently, consecutively, what would be the thing that you think needs to shift or change, be that perceptions, be that technology access or, or whatever the thing is that will get other people to want to spend their lives in VR. What do you think that thing is? And I'm going to start with you, Sarah, because you are the alum on this particular episode. I think it, it's down to making headsets and not making you look silly when you're wearing a headset. I'm going to go with that answer this time. So, <laughs> so both Dean and I really suffered from additions to our facial features where, where, <laughs> where we, we had headsets kind of pushed into us all the time and, and my hair was going a little bit crazy. Fringes aren't very good in VR because they don't rest on headsets. <laughs> so my hair was all over the place and, and it's that uncomfortability of mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. So making things easier and lighter and more attractive so you don't look really silly walking around the streets of Coventry with a headset on, those kinds of things will really help shift it. So mm-hmm. once we've got better glasses and that kind of thing, I think that will really help. And it'll also take it away from that image that, you know, if you're in VR, you're isolated in a room with a big headset on with loads of wires and cables mm-hmm. because you know, your 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 fifty year old woman at home wanting to go shopping and try things on virtually isn't gonna find that image very appealing. And she mm. isn't gonna recognise or associate herself with that image. So it's about making it better, more accessible and easier. Okay. Dean, what would be that one thing that you think needs to happen from your perspective? I well I think as an industry we need to get so much better at telling the outside world so all of those consumers that have not yet consumed how vr will fit into their lives now we forget about so as an industry we're brilliant at all talking to each other and that's why the last but um, to be fair that's why the last kind of three or four years has been a great kind of beta test bed for getting to where we are now but the problem is in in the last two years journalists talking and you know with the ear of consumers are already talking up the fact that vr is dead there's not enough people buying it whatever else you know part of that is that it as an industry it's it was almost kind of out unleashed to the you know the general public to be able to buy something almost too early and um, now it's fine if you're very conscious of saying this is still early days and it's going to evolve and everything else but when you've got the likes of samsung giving loads of them away free with a with a phone then you know it kind of has to be right mm. um so so the the message really is you know tell people how this fits into their lives and don't just tell them, you know, how amazing this will be if they've got access to it and it's not amazing yet. So tell them, you know, if, if you're going to if you're going to go shopping uh, in VR, don't give them the ability to do that now if it's not better than what they do on their laptop or their phone or mm-hmm. in a shop. And in the same way, you know, don't make access to content more difficult than it can. We're in that horrible middle ground at the moment where everyone wants to make a VR platform. So they all want to launch an app that then goes on a phone that then allows people to browse some stuff, then download something else that then allows them to fill it with content. Now, if you want to buy a piece of music, you just 
you just stream something or if you want to rent or buy a movie you go to itunes and it's yours mm. now that's where the consumers need to be otherwise if it's too many sets it's already a huge leap for a consumer to stick a phone or plug in a pc and then put something on their head before they've even got anything to view in it mm. that I, you know, if I wasn't in the if I wasn't in the industry, I couldn't be asked to go through any of that. <laughs> but you know what? It's so you, I, I kind of want to reiterate what you're saying here, which is that there is so many people who are doing content just because they can, not because they should. And it's this thing I say at so many conferences. It's like just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I I, I kind of completely agree with you in as much as there needs to be more consideration about you know, why we are doing this stuff, why why is it being made, why is it being put where it's being put. But also that 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 thing that you said as well, which is that we're so good about talking to ourselves as an industry that we often forget that there are other people outside of our industry who still don't even understand what VR and AR actually is. You know, we've got so used to it, we just say VR and AR. So I've, I've actually had to go through a re-education process recently where I don't say VR and AR anymore. I actually say virtual reality and augmented reality because <laughs> you forget that not everybody knows what those things mean. You know, it's, To them, it's just a bunch of, of alphabet soup that you're kind of spurting out every time you say, what do you do? Oh, I do VR and AR and MR and AI and XR. And <laughs> you're just like, just pick a letter, any letter. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think part of the problem as well that we found in, in during the whole 48 hours is mm-hmm. that it's still not easy. It's still, like there's still so many technical <laughs> Download issues. Download this, update that. Download this, update that. Things that should be simple plug and play. As being said, you know, when you go and buy something, it's, it's quick and it's easy. We are not in that world yet where yeah. it is quick and easy. We are so far off having it really, really accessible. And that's why so many people are just going for whatever's on your phone and putting mm. on a cardboard headset mm. because that's what they can do that's quick and easy not the best experience Mm -hmm. but it's the most accessible one because we had so many times where we we were shifting from from different machines that we had a a, quite a big setup with different machines going around Mm. but things weren't working on one um they were working on the other and everything else so we we're still not at that level yet where it is plain and simple and i think even if you are actually in this industry and you're a tech you know savvy person even then you know you two are both pretty savvy on this stuff even then it can be complicated and that that has to be a challenge for anybody who's not within the industry trying to experiment or test on this this stuff you know and have their first experience but what I will say is thank you so much for joining us in reality. <laughs> and as always, we like to give our listeners a way to be able to find out a little bit more about you. We ask you to do that by sharing with us your social media handle of choice. So what would that be, Dean? It's Active Right Brain. So A-C-T-I-V-R-I-G-H-T-B-R-A-I-N. Wonderful. And Sarah? I'm at Virtual Sarah J. Wonderful. I'm not spelling it. <laughs> it's all, if they don't know it by now Sarah honestly <laughs> Jeez. but as always uh, we want to thank you for listening and if you enjoy this content don't forget to subscribe and review and follow us on Twitter at digitaljamltd digitaljamsessions.com